Okay, so welcome everybody to the Research Data Management Essentials session. This is run from the Research Data team in the library. My name is Rachel. I'm going to be presenting today with my colleague Nick, who will be joining us shortly. The format for the webinar today is that I will tell you something about the supporting materials that are available in Minerva. Some of you might have already had a chance to have a look at those, but don't worry too much if you, if you haven't yet. The main meat of today's session really is to encourage you to write a data management plan and as part of that think about your own data. We'll suggest some things that you might want to think about when you're thinking about your data and planning your data collection and storage and sharing. We'll encourage you to consider metadata, so that's descriptive information about your data and documentation. Not the most interesting stuff sometimes, but it's really good to get into good habits of documenting things as you go along. We'll also, towards the end of the session, explain what uh, data repositories are in a bit more detail and give you some options about how you can share your research data with other people. And then at the end of the slides, there's some suggested what next options, including a link to the Minerva materials, which, as you may have seen, there is some material which we uh, ask you to look at either before or after the session. But there's also some other bits and bobs in there where you can link off to some further training or support and exercises. And you can always contact us in the research data team by email on research data inquiries. We're always very happy to, to hear from you after the session if there's something that you think about afterwards. And as I say, there will be regular stops as we go along in case there are particular questions that you would like to raise. We'll just do an interactive exercise to get going, which is when we say data, what three words come to mind for you? So as you can see, you've got um, information is always something that comes up when we run this poll as a kind of big word. Um, what we've got numbers, we've got analysis, experiments, graphs, sorts of da data visualization, statistics. Data collection, that's an important phase in your um, experimental design, your project design. Some of you have mentioned sensitive information. Data, Sherlock Holmes quote, well, that's, uh, <laughs> perhaps you'd like to share the quote in the chat, whoever's put that. No, we normally get Star Trek, but I've never seen Sherlock Holmes before. Yeah, yeah, Star Trek or something. Computers, algorithms, so those are the kind of um, quantitative stuff, analytical data. But equally, you could have qualitative uh, information. Some, some of you have put qualitative. I noticed GDPR. So you might have data that's very sensitive that you have to handle in a particular way. Nerdy. Well, we won't take that too personally. But <laughs> so, yeah, that's one aspect of it. You might have audio material. Yeah, it could be words. So you could have textual data. Um, it is your findings, yeah. Video, so you've got audio, you've got video, you've got text. So there's different formats of data that you might be analysing. Confusing, yeah. We, I think we can all relate to that one. <laughs> Confusing potentially, or maybe just lots and lots of data. You might have long lists, collection, algorithms, security. So that's overlapping with the GDPR, the kind of legal aspects of of data processing. That's great. So thank you all for, for sharing those. And as you can see, depending upon what your subject area is, um, very, very different sorts of uh, concerns. That's the, that's the quote, Rachel. Data, 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 he cried impatiently. Wow. I can't make bricks without clay. So thank you very much, everybody, for that. Um, diversity of, of responses. And uh, I can't make bricks without clay. And another quote that we sometimes use is, Without data, you're just another person with an opinion. Data absolutely underpins all of your research and all of your reported findings, whether it's in your thesis, whether it's at a conference, whether it's a, a published journal article. So this is really crucial stuff. And not only do you need to think about your data, you need to think about how you describe, save, understand the data long term. So some of you might have had an opportunity to look at the modules labelled 1, 2 and 3 in Minerva, but don't worry if, if not. Um, it's a good idea to maybe just have a look after the session for some consolidation. Briefly, the three modules just set this face-to-face -face session in a bit of context. Module 1 
basically encourages you to think about what data you have. So you've already kind of started to think about this in terms of what three words does data make you think of. So what is it that you're actually going to be generating in your research or using in your research? For many of you, this will be raw data, or original data that you're going to generate yourself. But for others of you, it could be third party data. So data that's sourced from elsewhere. Always log what it is that you're using and where it is that you source the material from. It could be digital data, it will be digital for many of you, but it could equally be physical types of data. Uh, and again, the module asks you to think about, well, you're working in a kind of a wider environment when you're designing your research project and curating your research data. Some of you might have received funding from research funders, for example, and research funders quite often have a um, a policy or a requirement that data is handled and shared in particular ways. And similarly, there is a, a research data management policy from the university. One interesting idea, or hopefully useful, that we introduce in the first module is around a data life cycle, which we're going to say more about shortly. The second short module very dull. It's really about your day-to-day -day housekeeping, really boring stuff about file naming and being really consistent and having a good folder structure, thinking about your file formats. Although it's not the most interesting, potentially really, really valuable stuff to think about sooner rather than later. Maybe it's something that you're already great at. That's fantastic. If you're already in good habits. Um, what this is encouraging you to do is think about data that you need to access now and organize now, but that you might be coming back to next year or the year after or the year after. Will you be able to understand what's there? What documentation do you need to know? Ah, yes, this is the file naming convention I have. This is how I know what my most up to date version of this file is. This is where my data is stored. And so to make sure that you don't lose it. These are the decisions that I've made about my, my data. This is a description of how I did how I um, gathered this data. So it's really tools that you put together as you go along to think actually how am I going to understand this data when I come back to it in potentially quite a long time after I've uh, generated it. And a lot of you are doing P PhDs, you'll be generating a lot of data over that period of time so it's important to just try and wrangle it and organising it as best you can. And the final third short module is about data sharing. So this is saying, well, you might want to share some or all of the material that you're generating after the end of your research project or during your research with other people outside your immediate research team. And we'll be saying more about this. But basically, within the research data team here in the library, we have a repository system, which is an online database where researchers at the University of Leeds can deposit data for sharing with others. And a lot of that data is openly available to the world. So it's a good way of, of um, putting, putting data public so that, for example, if you're publishing a paper, that you can reference that data explicitly and unambiguously. So something that you'll come across more and more, I think, um, as the years go by is data statements within published journal articles, which are still relatively new, but are becoming much more common. And they're actually a requirement now from some of the funding councils. This means that you say explicitly what data underpins your journal article and where and how that data can be accessed. Two other interesting or useful um, pieces of information that are in that third module are um, information about persistent identifiers. So one persistent identifier is called a DOI. Does anybody, can anybody type in the chat what DOI stands for? And then uh, while, while you're thinking about that, uh, another identifier is an ORCID. So an ORCID is an identifier for you as an individual researcher. It's free to get, but it's something that disambiguates you from other people who might have similar names. So anybody got a suggestion what a DOI is? Digital Object Identifier. Thank you, Jonathan. That's excellent. So this is a permanent 
identifier, a unique identifier for something online. And it's better than using a URL like to point to a web page because a DOI is permanent. So even if the material moves from one location to another, the DOI goes with it. So when you click on that DOI, it will always point to the material that it's associated with. So these are you know, useful, helpful, hopefully concepts that you might want to just spend a little bit of time with the material in Minerva having a look at those. I mentioned the research data life cycle. Um, there are lots of different life cycles out there. This one is sourced from the UK Data Archive. It really is just a, a tool to encourage you to think ahead uh, about your research data so that you're planning not just for what you need now, but planning ahead for later. We take a, an example, supposing you were doing some interviews, so you will have planned ahead and decided what type of questions you're going to ask and how you're going to structure that data as, it, as it's gathered. You might uh, then analyze the data, you know, mark up the data in some kind of way, analyze the findings, and then you might publish a paper or a conference paper or put it into your thesis. But then there's a question a little bit further down the line, like if you're publishing a journal article, you might suddenly think, oh, actually, it'd be really useful to say to share my research data that's associated with this journal article publicly. And you realize that when you talk to your interviewees, although you've been through the ethical review process and you've written a consent form, the consent says that you're going to delete all the data at the end of the project. And you haven't, for example, explained that, ah, that might be some data like anonymized data uh, or, or the types of data that might be shared uh, later on in your research. So you have to be very careful about thinking ahead to what you want to do with the data. Now, these, these are just stages in the life cycle that you might want to consider in your particular context. And the the life cycle runs in parallel, really, with a data management plan. So this is the idea that you'll have a document that will help you think about what data you're gathering and what processes you're applying to those data. And that if you adopt good habits early on, potentially it could save you time later, avoid some of these problems where you realize you don't have the consent wording that you really needed, or that you've got into a, an industrial partnership with a collaborator and that, that you haven't actually thought about sharing some of the data at the end of the project. So it's all about thinking ahead. So there is a data management plan template mm -hmm. that we use in training and offer to anybody at the University of Leeds. And uh, it's downloadable from the university library website and it's linked from the Minerva materials also. But just trying to get a, a feel for, have you seen or downloaded a copy of the Leeds oh. data management plan? We use the word data but really that can be quite problematic for some disciplines and it's it's up to you really to think about what it is that's informed the findings that you put in your thesis so in some cases like in more artsy disciplines um, or social sciences sometimes the it might be more appropriate to talk about sources influences um, the analysis that you've performed so that somebody can see when they read your conclusions they can almost trace back and have a look at the materials that you looked at in order to reach your conclusions. Now sometimes that means that you would share these examples as data in their own right but for example if there's lots of third party material like that belongs to somebody else you can't necessarily share that but you might say share a full bibliography with annotations so that somebody could go back and have a look at some of these materials that you've had a look at so if you've got highly theoretical um, analysis it is more about looking at how did you choose which sources you were going to analyze and could somebody recreate the corpus that you looked at for example hope that helps so there's, there's no easy answer really it's for you to maybe just have a, a chew over and a think about so um let me show you this as Nick's saying, we talk about open research um, and, and talk about research outputs as well as data, because data, I think it sits well with scientific disciplines and with many disciplines, but not with all by any means. So we know that terminology can be a bit off-putting. 
Perhaps it'll be a bit clearer when we look at the different parts of a data management plan in a second. Before we look at the template, just to say that according to the policy at the University of Leeds, all projects, research projects at the university should really have a data management plan. I mentioned research funders as well. You might find when you come to apply for funding to an external body, for example, one of the UK Research Council, something like that, that they ask you to submit a data management plan as part of your application. So one of the functions of a data management plan at, when you're applying for funding is to identify some of the costing and resourcing issues that, you, that your project um, needs so that you can build those into your budget. But for many of you, you might not be doing a data management plan for funding. You might be doing a data management plan because you're doing a PhD, for example. For those of you who registered for your PhD after 2019, um, there is a requirement in the regulations for you to, to draft a data management plan by the time you come to transfer. But we'd recommend a data management plan for anybody doing any research project. The data management plan is something that you would write but ideally come back to as part of your project management as part of your research process and update it as things change. And your data management plan can be what we've put there proportionate. Now what we mean by that is if you are say a sole researcher, maybe you're working in a, a highly theoretical discipline as has just been um, given an example in the chat. You might have a fairly thin data management plan. It might not need to be very extensive. It's mainly between you and your supervisor. It's proportionate. It's, it's as long as it needs to be for your particular research. Whereas if, say, you were part of a, an international project with multiple partners generating large volumes and complexities of data, you might well have a significant and uh, long data management plan that makes sure that everybody across the project is working in a similar way. So it depends. But what we one starting point would be the Leeds Data Management Plan template. So the, the Leeds Data Management Plan template uh, is, is what we use in, in training and if you're doing a PhD you might want to adopt it but you don't have to, you can use any te template that you prefer really. Sometimes if you're applying to a funder they might have their own data management plan template that they ask you to use. But what we've done here is looked at lots of different templates from funders and from other universities and what you find is you see the same sections occurring again and again. So we put those into a template with 10 sections and on the pages three and four of the template, you'll see that there's also some prompt questions for each of the sections. Briefly then, the 10 sections are for the section one, you've already started to think about this. Um, what data are you going to produce? And also data from third parties that you might need to log. So have a think about that. Then consider how and where your material is going to be stored. You need to make sure that you don't lose the material. Uh, so for example, it needs to be safe if you're generating it in a field location, making sure that you have it on, say, an encrypted laptop, but that you upload it onto fully backed up university storage as soon as you can. So it's about organizing and storing your materials and also thinking about your file formats. We'll say a little bit more about file formats in a second. Section three, who needs to have access to the materials that you're working with during your project and how are you going to facilitate that? For some of you, that might be straightforward. Others of you, it might be more complex. So for example, section four is about ethics and legal compliance. And some of you mentioned quite sensitive areas, like I think there was something about extremism and terrorism, for instance. So that section for you might well be a, a significant section about how you make sure that you are handling any materials that you have ethically and legally and then that will overlap with section three for example who else needs to have access to that material during your project and how are you going to manage that section five asks you to think about documentation uh, of your data so, and it's easier to do this at the time than to try and do it later on Again, have a think about that scenario where you're coming back to data two years after you've generated it and you need enough information and context to make sure that you understand what you have. Section six is about training. Are there any particular training requirements? For those of you who are doing a PhD, you could um, think about this in the context of your training plan. Are there skills 
and again, you could have a look at the uh, data management life cycle and think, well, is there anything right from the design to data collection to data organization, visualization? Are there, are there points that you need and training and support and feed that into your data management plan and your training plan? Section seven is about sharing beyond the project. I mentioned repositories. There are mechanisms to help you share with other researchers, um, the general public even, uh, data and materials beyond the end of your project or outside your immediate project team. Section eight, think about intellectual property. So that's who owns the rights in the materials that you're generating. For instance, if you source material from somebody else and it comes to you with a license, does that license allow you to share the data with anybody else? Uh, is it an open license that allows you to build on the material? So a lot of the, the data that we share in the data repository has a Creative Commons license on it, for example, where somebody could download the data, they could analyze it and build on it and then reshare the data. So, Think about intellectual property rights, who owns the data, what licenses does it come with? Who will be involved in managing the data, section nine, the roles and responsibilities. Again, that might be quite a significant section if you are part of a large project. And importantly, I think that section 10, and this is sometimes missing from some of the data management templates, is thinking long, long term. So in terms of data curation, what is going to be kept? How long is it going to be kept for? What gets deleted? What gets deposited in a long term repository? So to make this a little bit more concrete, we're actually we have an example of a data management project from a robotics team. And we're just going to share a couple of examples from their data management plan. The first thing, I mean, and this isn't really rocket science, but it's just a really nice, easy way of emphasizing some of these issues is that, you know, tables um, can be really useful to give, you know, a summary of the kinds of data you'll be created and using a project. It could also include non-digital data as well. You know, if you are dealing with samples or laboratory in instruments or physical or archival material, as you just referred to, Sarah. Um, and again, it might be necessary to have additional columns, you know, if you did need storage locations for digital, non-digital data, um, or who's responsible for a large team across the disciplines or institution. So, you know, it's a, it's a fairly straightforward approach, but, you know, deceptively simple and deceptively useful approach at that. Um, so a couple of uh, data types to highlight in this particular example, um, the design files. So this lists um, file formats used in both the live project and the format for exchange and long-term archiving. So um, this is important to think about, you know, in, in all sorts of contexts in terms of data management, you know, if you're dealing with proprietary data types or uh, file formats, for example, so in this case, .sldprt, apparently it's not um, software I'm particularly personally familiar with, but it's a file format specific to uh, a commercial software package called SOLIDWORKS, which is CAD, Computer Aided Design Package. So that's going to be the best um, file format and the most convenient for you during the project, but obviously it will require access to a SOLIDWORKS license. So they have also decided to store .igs format, um, which is an open format, and so that's going to be better for long term or for exchange with colleagues who don't have access to SOLIDWORKS. Um, so it's always better to use, you know, a non-proprietary or standard format um, wherever possible, um, but you may also need to share the proprietary version as well, um, you know, because that may be necessary as well. <clears throat> the other thing to um, emphasize is software. Um, so again, very conscious that we've got all sorts of uh, different disciplines represented um, in our virtual room today, I'm sure. Some will be using software, I'm sure, some won't. But often researchers do admit to consider software, you know, which is a valuable output from projects and often essential for validation and reproducibility. We'll talk a bit more about reproducibility later as well in the context of open research. In this context, um, MATLAB was used as a software plat development platform with the code stored in the .m format. Now, actually, that is a proprietary format, .m though um, it's also actually plain text, so it's not a binary format, et cetera, so it's human readable, so it's going to be fairly straightforward for anyone with the, you know, the technical chops to actually be able to implement the code in another programming language, language. so in this case, it's not necessarily to, necessary to have an alternative um, format to the .m, um, but just to highlight just how important an output 
software is and increasingly you know falls under this data category as well in terms of what should be uh, stored shared and managed through the research life cycle so the next thing to highlight in this context is to say you know this is why we choose this example as uh, as something that's got a range of different data types and it's got interviews as well um, so you can see here that rather than seeing interviews as a single data type, the project team have recognized that the original audio recordings would likely cover sensitive topics. They were relatively easy to identify the research participants, obviously, just by what somebody sounds like. Whereas the anonymized transcripts of the interview will be suitable for sharing subject consent by those participants. And we'll come back to the issue of consent later and in terms of how important that is to, to, to get at the outset, you know, if you haven't got the appropriate consent to share, for example, um, anonymized transcripts, uh, then you are going to limit how you can share material, obviously, later on. So it's very important to think of consent at the, out, uh, at the outset. Um, so that then has, in turn, has implications for how the audio files were stored and who was given access during the project arrangements for destruction at the end of the project whereas the transcription files can actually be shared so you need to see you've got the additional column there in terms of sensitivity so again it's just breaking things down into the different um, elements of what you need to consider uh, you know in terms of your specific data um, that you're managing <clears throat> now in terms of metadata and documentation in this example um, the debt protection protocols will be fully documented um, and the project team have also highlighted um, that the, the, the importance of planning for the process is about annotating the data as it's captured so obviously it's much easier to do that as you go along and make sure that everybody's sort of singing from the same hymn sheet if you like. Having documented it a documented and consistent approach to data collection will help ensure the research team are collecting data in the same way to the same standard and this consistent approach will also ensure data quality with clear guidance labeling and protection of participants through transcription and coding so it's much easier to ensure quality if there's a script or a pro form to work from so again it's not you know um, groundbreaking necessarily but it's just basic sort of you know project management to ensure that this is happening consistently across your own processes and uh, especially if you're working with a team of colleagues um, and from the beginning this project recognized the potential value of their data and plan to share it um, so sharing the data with necessary metadata and data guides should be, make it much easier to reuse and cite so again Rachel was alluding earlier to the importance of actually sharing methodology and all that kind of thing so it's not just about the raw data but making sure it's fully documented um, so that it can actually be reused by others and also by yourself you know it's easy to to think you'll remember what a particular um, set of data is but you know if just a week or a month or six months or a year down the line you if you haven't got adequate documentation that's going to be much more difficult um, some of this is addressed in a, a light-hearted video that we've th that's in the additional resources in Minerva um, which is recommended it's only I think three or four minutes long so have a look at that if you um, would like to so <clears throat> Come to you now, so let me have a, a little pause. But really, while we, you know, emphasising, and we've already touched on some of this with Sarah in particular, has already come up with an example from her own research. But really, we're emphasising that data without metadata and documentation and context um, could be re greatly reduced in its value, and may no longer allow the research findings to be reproduced or the data used for other purposes. So that's what we're trying to achieve. What will a future researcher want and need? And again, as I say, remember, it might be you wanting to reuse this data in the future. <clears throat> so really what we're saying is that capturing the research context may feel like an overhead, but it'll certainly turn out to be an investment. You know, it'll save your, your time in the future when you come to write your dissertation or to present at a conference or publish a paper. And to share the associated data, your tasks are going to be a lot easier if you've captured the full methodology in a way that you and others can understand. Um, that could include, you know, the sample preparation method, participant selection and characteristics, laboratory operating procedures, you know, and again, interested to hear from you what other examples you might be able to think of from your own context. We still get asked quite a lot, is it okay in the paper, I'm publishing a paper, is it okay to say the data is available on request? 
and increasingly the answer is not really so certainly some funders say we don't want you to put that we want you to be much more explicit about how you can get hold of the data i don't know if anybody's ever come across a kind of you know contact the authors for the data statement or something like that in a journal article i've seen anecdotes as well along those lines where people you know that actually very often the uh, researchers don't get back or you know the the emails changed or you can't actually access the data so that's an example of why that's not always well you know as special says increasingly not recommended practice So, so yeah, something you found in your literature group, your PhD. So you want to make sure that when you reference sources, especially archival sources, that other people can find them too. So that's really interesting, Sarah. So that is, um, I mean, just to mention, uh, 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 we have been doing, uh, uh, they'll be available soon, but a, a set of open research case studies. Um, and one of the colleagues that's working on that was very interested in archival research because she was an archival researcher. She's just completed her PhD. Um, and that was something that she wanted to explore in particular. And I think this is a problem that um, because it is can't be reshared, you know, and it is in archives, maybe dotted all over the place. She was looking at archives in, Af in America, etc. That she was very interested in sort of exploring this and establishing best practice. I suppose that's a lesson here as well that best practice might perhaps isn't yet established, and you know, you're the um, person to perhaps try and establish that, you know, in terms of a specific discipline. So none of this is set in stone. There's material that it would have been perfectly legitimate to keep actually and where, for example, that the participants might have been absolutely more than willing for you to keep it for longer, but that there was just some wording in the participant information sheet of the consent which said, you know, within three years of the end of the project that all the data will be deleted or something like that without differentiating between the raw data, for example, and anonymized data. And so that's interesting that you wish now yeah. that you'd been able to keep some of that data. Really good observation. It's a, it's, a, it's a major headache for us as well, isn't it, Rachel? In that, you know, very often either that, just as you said, or people, are, are, they haven't actually quite put two and two together and, you know, they've not given enough attention to that consent. And by the time it gets to us to share, we look back over the consent and the ethics, which will come on to in, in a moment. And, and we say, well, actually, you can't share this ethically because um, of the consent wording that went to the participants. So, yeah, it, it it's something we really try to emphasize yeah and there's an example um, there i think from claire. claire about contextual documentation i think so in terms of the assessment that you might want to share not just the the results if you can you know again you'd have to think ethically about about whether you could anonymize realistically and, and whether those data should and can be shared but that if you did that you might be sharing it alongside the assessment tool if, if you were able to share that so again it's just to try and give as much context so that people can understand your findings and what tools you used michelle said uh, collect cells and do experiments in the lab uh, uh, dare i ask what sort of cells i mean um you know this, one of the challenges of our job michelle is uh, you know we um as i often say to people i've got a bachelor's degree in english so i can read you know and very you know you 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 colleagues are studying all sorts of um different disciplines that you know from quantum physics to french history so it, it's the challenge for us to necessarily know what the issues are for your particular research but we're always happy to discuss it yeah, I mean, um, if, you know, if it's saying, cells, cells from a potato were very different from cells that has been sourced from a tissue bank for humans. So, yeah. you know, you you would um, there would be particular protocols where you need to be really careful again about if you've sourced from a tissue bank, that what are the terms and conditions that you need to observe to be ethical and what elements of your analysis can you share? So um, we're not proposing to answer these right now, but it's something that you would need to think ahead so that you're really clear what you wanted to do with the material and the analysis. The potatoes have rights as well, Rachel, I just suggest. Um, Paul is saying, so she's mentioned ethnographic research. Now this is, I don't know if you could comment on it, because that's an area that's uh, potentially particularly complex in terms of consent and sharing. Is it perhaps, Rachel, I'm not sure? Well, we'll be coming on to the ethics and obviously you'll need to have thought about your research methodology and all, always when data is sourced from people, you have to have gone through the ethics process. So you will have thought about the ethics of how you're going to gather, you'll have thought about the ethics of consent 
um, of choosing your population, etc. And alongside that, alongside doing your ethics, you would do your data management plan so that one makes sense in the context of the other. Again, there's not, not necessarily a right answer. The main thing is to have thought carefully about what's appropriate in your context. The university has a data protection website. It gives you some protocols about managing electronic information. So that would be one source of information. But there's also a lot of information on the it.leeds.ac.uk knowledge base about transferring data from A to B and gathering data in the field, making sure that your uh, equipment is encrypted and so on. So make sure that your data gathering protocols are as secure as they can be. So there's the sort of mechanics of the storage and getting stuff from A to B. But before that, there's a big ethical issue there about informed consent from the patients that the nurses are working with. So there's the consent from the nurses, but then there's how do you approach the um, the fact that there's going to be people who are seeking service, you know, do you do you seek consent from them? And this is what you'll need to address in your ethical review. And you'll get a feedback from the ethics committee about what they feel from an ethical point of view is, is reasonable. And then based on what you can do ethically, then you need to make sure that you've got the infrastructure to get your data securely stored, organised and copied over to probably OneDrive with encryption at the, at the university. Um, but again, I would refer you to IT and if during your ethical review process or when you're looking at IT material, you get confused. <laughs> it happens to us all. There's so much information out there and it does vary by individual circumstance. You can always come to us in the library. We might not have the answer, but we can quite often broker a conversation with somebody else that you need to talk to or signpost you to the relevant people. So don't struggle, um, but you need to take it step by step. And I do recommend that you look at data protection website, that you look at the information on the IT website. And there's also a lot of information about the ethical review process. If you haven't already been through that, again, that's all uh, on the university website. Yeah, though it's, that leads us quite nicely Dwee, into um, handling sensitive or confidential data. So thanks for that. That's really useful. And as I say, and as Rachel said there, you know, please do come to us because we can't, you know, hope to answer every specific question here. But uh, we, you know, we're always happy to to talk to you. Um, that's what we're here for. But in general terms, in terms of handling sensitive or confidential data. Um, you know, if you think back to the plan that Rachel shared earlier, you know, that's going to be addressed first through section four of your plan, ethics and legal compliance. So Rachel already referred to the importance of making sure you get ethical approval. But it's interesting to know, really, that, you know, uh, any sensitivity or risk associated with the data will have implications for pretty much, you know, most of the other sections as well. So how data is stored, that was number two, will depend on sensitivity, which uh, we was just referred to. How it can be shared or whether it can be shared at all um, uh, is sections three and seven of the uh, data management plan as well. What training is needed, you know, if there's particular protocols you need to observe in terms of um, uh, specifically sensitive data, roles and responsibilities. So again, you know, um, does everybody have access to that sensitive data in the big team, for example, or what are people's specific responsibilities to make sure things don't fall through the cracks, you know, that it's properly managed especially with sensitive data, which is obviously that much more important than non-sensitive data. That's all going to be influenced by the sensitivity or risk inherent in your data. There's useful guidance on various aspects of handling data on our website, on the research data website, as well as through IT that Rachel's just been alluding to, uh, starting with the information protection policy, perhaps, uh, um, again, I see Rachel's already posting links in there. So have a look at those um, and through the Secretary and data protection websites as we've already posted. Um, and we also have another training course uh, on safeguarding data done by our colleague who's not here today. Um, she's not in the session today, but that's our colleague Brenda who runs safeguarding research data. Uh, and you'll find the link to that on our websites as well. Um, yeah, thanks Rachel, she's posted the link to that as well. Um, so thinking more about ethics, consent and partnership, um, we've already touched on this, we've gone into a bit of detail on consent, but you know, it's a really good example just to reiterate of how decisions made early in a project uh, can have a major impact on what can be done with data at the end of the project. So a really good example of why you should always have the research and data lifecycle in mind when you're making decisions. 
Um, and again, you know, we've already said this, but you, just to reiterate, if the consent word it says the data will not be retained or shared or reused, then your options are going to be limited. If you're working with human participants, an ethical review will be undertaken early in the project and will cover consent and participant information. Um, <clears throat> another good example is industrial other partnerships. Um, to have the life cycle in mind there, because um, if you don't get the, you know, the right agreement in place at the start of the project, it could make it very difficult to publish your research and share the data you generate. And, you know, you might find that nobody seems that bothered about intellectual property early on, but as soon as money's involved further down the line, that may change. And if you haven't got the appropriate agreements in place right at the outset, then that's going to be an issue. Um, just a quick note on anonymization. You know, this is a question we get asked a lot. Um, it can be very confusing to, you know, to make sure that data is modified to such that interview transcripts can, you know, participants can no longer be identified in interview transcripts, for example, um, which is often a step that's needed to meet ethical guidelines and then, you know, the promises that you perhaps have made to in the consent wording to participants. Um, this is not an area that we are qualified necessarily to assist in, nor can we check everything. You know, we had one recently with obviously you know, potentially dozens or even hundreds of transcripts. We can't hopefully, you know, hope to, to to read through them all or even to know if they, you know, all the indirect identifiers have been taken out, that kind of thing. But as we keep saying, you know, just to be rest assured, you're not alone. There's lots of good practice in research groups, lots of support from the ethics team, the legal team, ours. Else, you know, and as Rachel said, we can try and broker between those different teams. So don't feel that you're on your own. Get help and assurance. Um, you know, we're very happy to work with you and try and figure these things out with you because it's not easy. Um, and you know, it's we do it uh, day in day out, and it's still not easy for us. So we know how hard it is. So please, uh, please ask if you're not sure. Um, and for example, you know, when sharing data, a data set, a blank consent form will be useful to future researchers to give them confidence that their use of your data is consistent with what your participants signed up to, for example. We'll just look at that. We'll have a break in a moment. We'll just look at ethics in the specific context of the rubber arm example. So you'll, you can see here that they've emphasised that the university informed consent protocol will be applied. Um, and they've also highlighted the um, uh, wording on their consent form and that I agree for the research data collected for me to be stored and used for future research in a non-identifying form. So that would actually put it out of scope for open sharing, the fact that it says future research and we have a separate repository called radar, which is really what we use for any human derived data, um, even with consent, just to make sure that, you know, if we're not completely sure that things are anonymized, it can be accessed and it's what's called fair data. We'll talk about fair data in a moment. So it's findable and accessible, but not necessarily open, um, just to, as an added protection for um, participants um, ethically, um, et cetera. Uh, and the statement anticipates some issues as well. So, you know, we're always, it's important to obtain any decisions and approaches as you go. Uh, they've also recognised that not all data can be shared. We often say that data should be as open as possible, as closed as necessary. Um, <clears throat> and they do anticipate some access restrictions. So it's again making sure that you just think through these issues as you go when you're writing your data management plan. And for example, in this case, some data may need to be destroyed. It's not all or nothing. You know, some data potentially can be shared openly. Some can be shared with controlled access. Some of it may need to be destroyed, depending on how that's been categorised through your um, data management plan and a table etc the processes we were looking at before so you've covered a lot of the data sharing um, incentives that, that we put on this slide this is this uh, reasons we came up with and what people tend to say so we've got good research practice transparency which some of you said it might be that you're allowing another um, researcher to avoid duplicating some research because they know that you've already um, done some research, for example. There might be ethical reasons why you would share. So if your participants are very keen that the results are shared, that could be a reason to, to share the data. Every few years, there's something called the Research Excellence Framework. It's a formal assessment process within um, in, in the UK about how f research funds are given to universities. And you'll see that uh, within that, the assessment criteria 
increasingly emphasise open, so open access, as we talked about right at the beginning, the papers, but looking beyond that and sharing other types of materials openly, being open about your methodologies and so forth. So in other words, it's the direction of travel in terms of research practice in the UK, I would say, is very much in the open research direction. We've mentioned funder expectations that they might expect you to share where you can, as Nick gave you that little phrase, share where you can uh, as openly as possible, but um, as closed as necessary. It's striking that balance, it'll be different for all of you. We talked earlier about data access statements where you might be publishing a, a journal article and you need to put in a formal access statement about your data. And as a couple of you have noticed that you can have an, a very uh, a, a strong impact in your field, but also for you as a personal researcher, as an individual researcher as well. And there is some evidence that if you publish a journal article that's got data associated with it that's available, it tends to be cited more heavily by other researchers than a similar paper that doesn't have data available. But again, as many of you've noticed, there are definitely legal and ethical considerations that you'll need to bring to bear when you're deciding what you can share. Um, but there could be other reasons as well. So for instance, you might be in the middle of writing up a publication and you don't want to share your data too soon because you might somebody else might publish from it sooner than you do. Um, so there might be reasons to just hold back the data a little bit, although we'd say mm, you could consider the data itself a type of publication. So you've got a date stamp on it, it's got your name on it, you can show that you were the first one that, that discovered this or that, that produced this data. So again, it's a balance, it depends on your circumstances. If you're in a science discipline, for example, and you're applying for a patent, for something, uh, an invention, then there are reasons why you might not want to share your data too soon because you can't because of the patent regulations regulations or say you've produced something that might have a commercial element to it and there is a commercial uh, exploitation arm at the university that can advise you on this so for example if you think the university and you are going to make money out of something again it might be a reason not to release it openly too soon anyway so lots of reasons why and why not and excellent comments in the chat thank you very much for all that now, I'll just say a quick word about FAIR data. We've very much emphasised open, open research, open access, open data. And as we've started to explore, you can still share material with other researchers that's not necessarily fully open. So we have a repository where you can put material that people have to register and sign an agreement before they can access that material. But it is still accessible. What you may come across in, certainly the EU emphasises this and several of the main funders in the UK emphasise this concept of FAIR, which means that the data, it might be open, but not necessarily. It means that the data could be potentially found, so you've described it in such a way that somebody looking for it could find it, that in that information, it's the data itself is either accessible or potentially accessible if they follow you know, whatever you've told them to do in order to access it, so it's potentially accessible. Interoperable means that the material's been described in such a way that you can potentially combine it with other data sets. This is very much an emerging area. Some subject areas are quite strong on this already, but not all. It's an emerging thing, but the idea is that you can get more out of data by combining it with other data. And then reusable, so I might be able to find something and say, yes, I can see it looks really useful, but there's no license on it. I've no idea what I can do with this material. So have a think about um, what license you would put on material that you're releasing. Uh, so that's the concept of FAIR, and as I'm sure you will come across it again. So with that, I'm going to hand over back to, to Nick, who's going to talk about what of all this data you're generating that you might keep. Thanks, Rachel. So yeah, we've talked about, you know, the full life cycle and all the different considerations that go into that. Depending on your discipline, um, you may be collecting vast amounts of data <coughs> um, and it's important to think about which of that data could be, should be uh, managed longer term and shared um, as we've been discussing, but also it's important to think about data appraisal as we call it, you know, what data to keep. Some of the questions to ask yourself here are what data must be retained or destroyed for contractual, legal or regulatory purposes. Um, 
so again this may be stuff that's gone through your ethical ethics process for example um, other important questions are what's irreplaceable or very expensive to repeat so i don't know an example of something irreplaceable might be um, a survey around you know a one-off political event like the brexit referendum for example where that's not going to happen again as much as some of us might want it to happen again and have a different result but um that's going to be irreplaceable or there might be uh, you know might be possible to repeat an experiment for example but that could be very expensive um so you know these are some of the considerations to, to think about we've already alluded to this as well you know does your data have any value uh, value beyond your publication or your thesis now that may not may be an unknown and i think i can't remember was it daniel uh, referred to that um earlier in the in the chat so you as a discipline expert may not necessarily appreciate how your data might be of value to a different discipline um and you know if you share it then that has a whole other life potentially beyond your own discipline um and the crucial one that as I say, we've alluded to a few times as well, is what data do you need to keep to validate the results of your published research? You know, increasingly the reproducibility um, crisis is a, it's often been called, although we're trying to get away from that word crisis, you know, the fact that an awful lot of research has been shown not to be actually possible to reproduce and sharing the data is a huge part of that. So it's part and parcel now of the academic landscape to make sure that you're sharing, um, you know, the fundamental data that underpins your results. Um, and bear in mind the um, life cycle throughout, you know, we keep coming back to that, that, that life cycle and how, you know, maybe working at different points of that life cycle with your own research and with others' research. And it's all about documentation, you know, it's not very exciting, it's not very glamorous, but it is really about um, documentation and bureaucracy, really, making sure that at the end of your project, leave your materials in good order and it's all, you know, you've got a paper trail in terms of consent, ethics, um, sharing decisions and where it can be found, etc. You know, everything is 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 is, uh, is, t is accounted for. <clears throat> so we're nearly there now. We've only got a 15 minutes or so to go. Um, so we'll talk. We touched again earlier on about repositories. Um, and again, just to emphasise that fact that today we've been talking about data repositories, but um, there's also the White Rose repository here, which is for journal articles um, or textual based output so it could be um, other types of textual material but specifically today we're talking about data repositories which will link back and forth we'll show you a couple of examples of that in a moment but when you're choosing a repository for your data a few questions you might ask is whether or not your funder has a preference so depending on who you're funded by if you are funded um, they may have their own data centers for example like the like NERC the natural environment uh, Research Council, they have their own data centres and they would expect you as a funded researcher to offer your data to them in the first instance. Um, or perhaps there's a well-established subject repository. Um, so Chris, the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Centre, for example, or GenBank is for genetic data. So we often refer to our, our repository as a repository of last resort, if you like. It's a general repository, but there may well be a more suitable repository for specialist data out there. Um, which you would be recommended to use. And if you're not sure, come along to us and we can check it out for you. Um, does your publisher have a preference? So increasingly specific journals work with specific um, repositories such as Figshare is one you may have heard of, or Dryad is another example, and they um, work with uh, the Behavioral Ecology Journal, for example. Um, or perhaps you have your own preference. So there's lots of potential repositories out there, Figshare I've already mentioned, Zenodo is a European Union one. Um, the main thing is to make sure that it's uh, got uh, it, it issues a DOI or equivalent and that it's going to look after your data in the long term. Again, if you're not sure, come to ask us. You can look at the re3data.org service as well, which is a registry of research data repositories. That's also a really good resource just to find data as well. You know, if you, you think, you know, you actually do a literature review, perhaps undertake a bit of a data review as well, see what sort of data is already out there for your own um, discipline um, and find potential repositories to share your own data through as well. Uh, and again, any of this you're not sure, just come on and speak to us and we can um, have a look with you. <clears throat> so we'll just talk briefly about uh, transparent and reproducible research because 
with the research data team, but increasingly work with our colleagues in the research support team around what's increasingly called, as I mentioned earlier, open research or open science. We tend to use the term open research just to be a bit more inclusive of the humanities, because in English anyway, uh, science tends to evoke the STEM subjects, whereas talking about open across the full range of disciplines. So if we, obviously today we've been talking about open data or open and fair data. And the fact it's very difficult, impossible to fully reproduce a study without the original data. But other aspects of open that are increasingly important um, are open source software. So again, we've talked about that a little bit in terms of uh, proprietary file format. So think about that, you know, in terms of the software that you may be using, such that anybody can view, use, modify or distribute software and code for any purpose. If you're writing your own code to make sure it's openly licensed, all that kind of thing as well. Open hardware. Um, so increasingly, this is uh, important as well in terms of making sure that the any systems, computer systems you're using are fully documented and openly, um, you know, again, non-proprietary so that others can reproduce your um, compu computational environments, that kind of thing. Open access we've touched on, so this is about making your research freely available on online to be downloaded, read and reused under an open license. I've already mentioned the White Rose Research Online repository. Um, if you are publishing through your um, if, if for PhD students, if you're publishing through your degree, you'll find that increasingly an awful lot of what we call APCs, the article processing charges, are taken care for you um, in terms of deals that we have with um, various publishers. If not, you can get in touch. It, again, this is another potentially quite complex um, landscape that we can help you with if you're not sure about any costs that may be associated with publishing open access. Um, and then this is like open notebooks, so to make sure that um, lab notebooks and that kind of thing are fully open, et cetera. This is a sort of area of growth and research culture um, at the University of Leeds in particular and across the sector. So we have um, a series of monthly talks called Open Lunch um, with reflections on open research. You can catch up if somebody can find the link. Maybe I'll find it in a moment myself. Um, we record them all and they're all available to catch up with on the library blog. So in previous events, we've discussed preprints, for example. Um, we've talked about um, reproducible research in the social sciences. Some funders, Wellcome Trust, are very big on open research. Um, open Library of the Humanities is another model of open access publishing. I've just noticed your question, Jim, I'll come on to that in a moment, in terms of some of the models around open access to publications. And citizen science is increasingly important. Um, all of these are advertised on research email lists and Twitter. Um, if you, there is a, I'll post a link in a moment, Gemma, but as I, as I was saying, the landscape is changing quite dramatically. Um, and if you are um, funded by UKRI, that's really your only option to have any open access publishing fees covered that aren't already covered by the existing deals that we have. Um, so there is a, a form to apply for that. But as I say, if you're not funded by UKRI, then you're probably not going to be eligible for that, but it may not matter depending on which journal you're going for because it may be already covered by one of the deals. So Rachel just po posted the link there, so you should be able to find the information there. If not, give us a shout and we can help you out. Um, because it, you know, it, it, it could and should be simple, but it might not, <laughs> I suppose is the message. And if you're not sure and if you're struggling with, you know, if a particular journal you want to publish in isn't covered by one of our deals, uh, or you're not funded, then um, speak to us and we'll see if there's anything we can do. Um, so in terms of what's next, uh, these slides will be made available. Uh, the additional material in Minerva is available, so that's got links to various courses and videos and some exercises. Um, write your data management plan, uh, run it by us if you wish. Um, keep good records and, and think in the long term and you know always bear in mind that research data life cycle. And I think that's about it, really. So any more questions? And that's how to contact us either through our website, um, and we posted various links there and throughout this uh, by email. We're on Twitter, if anybody's on Twitter, which is uh, uh, an easy way to contact us as well, or via the repository there.